college student in India. I've been fascinated by this. It's subtle, it's nuanced. And I spent a lot of years thinking about it and actually spent 25 years writing a book on the subject. And that's what the book is. Uh, the book is a book on mathematics. And I'm not going to tell you about the details of the book. That's not relevant for our purposes. It's just to show you that this is something which has fascinated me for a long time. Um, but the book is relevant insofar as the fact that it's an unusual mathematics book in that I teach mathematics by telling stories. And so I'm going to tell you two stories today. But first, before I launch into the stories, the subject is of a great antiquity. It's been with us for more than 5,000 years. Here's a lovely frieze I am very fond of. It's a frieze showing two Assyrian women playing a game of chance. You'll find this in the British Museum near King's College in London. As you walk in, you go to the left, and if you ever get a chance to do that, you should, because you'll find the Rosetta Stone on your left, and this is one of those epochal periods in human history. And right next to that, you'll find this Assyrian frieze. I was quite delighted when I first saw this. Two young women playing a game of chance 5,000 years ago. And of course, what are they doing? They're playing dice. But of course, not the modern dice you see on the screen. The dice they had were made of bones. They're called astragale. And I've shown you a picture of the dice on the left of your screen. Chance and his manifestations have been with us for centuries, for millennia. And in the modern day, chance touches almost all aspects of our lives. The 21st century is ineluctably the century of data, big data. And in this century, the data are almost inevitably chance generated. And therefore, if there's one thing that everybody who is educated should understand, it is something about the machinations of chance, because chance touches everything. I'm going to give you two examples. So now that asked me, he says, what, what are you going to talk about? And I was in the throes of getting some papers written and taking care of my students. And I said, I don't have time to think about this. And I, OK, here's a list of five topics. I'll pick a couple. Okay, so I picked a couple. And if people are really interested, I can talk a little bit more about others. But I'm going to give you two topics. Chance affects everybody today. And so it is, behooves us to understand a little bit about the technical machinations and what an understanding of the underlying mathematical foundations will do for us. So let's begin with one application, which is particularly relevant to the modern day. It's a long title. I'll give you a chance to read it. It's a mystifying title. Well, what does feudal city-state have to do with the Holy Roman Empire? And what on earth does it have to do with the modern day pandemic which is ravaging the world and the lockdowns, the social isolation, the quarantines? And what the hell does that have to do with this query object called random graphs? If you've been following the news, um, especially if you've been following the epidemiological experts, it's always wise to listen to experts rather than other folks, policymakers or politicians or neighbors who just want to pontificate on a subject. When you want to really understand something, go to an expert. Start with their, their assessments. And then of course you reserve the right to an independent judgment, but go to the experts. If you're watching what the experts in epidemiology might tell you, words like a mystical number are not coming to play. I would explain a little bit about what that means, okay? Of course, you're talking about the spread of disease and that's entirely why in India is under lockdown. If you have a disease for which you do not have an immunity and sadly for the coronavirus, for COVID-19, nobody in the world has natural immunity. And if you have a disease for which you do not have a vaccine to create an immunological response and sadly for COVID-19, we do not have a vaccine. What is left? If you do not want your medical systems, your hospital systems to get completely overwhelmed, the only thing left to do is try to physically prevent the spread of it. 
so that your hospital systems have enough capacity to handle the rate at which people are getting sick. Otherwise, you'll get social collapse. And of course, with social collapse will be economic, political, and nationwide collapse. And so the only solution then is a very blunt instrument, this idea of social isolation. Let me show you a couple of pictures to try to drive this out. Imagine you have a population of 10 people. The first picture I'm going to show you is each person is a dot, or in the language of the mathematical discipline of graph theory, it is a vertex. And what I'm going to do is draw a line between vertices, a line between people, if they are in touch with each other. 5,000 years ago, about, let's say, uh, around 3,000 BC, imagine that a city-state, a small hamlet was started, perhaps somewhere they did subcontinent, say, in Jaipur. Each year, a new city-state emerges somewhere on the subcontinent, say, Pataliputra, in Kalinga, you know, each year one. When two hamlets land close to each other, then eventually they merge and they form a larger, let's say, a mini metropolis. Okay, and so you now we can see the connection to a random graph. I'm going to mimic the creation of a graph like this by throwing in cities, vertices, one at a time. And when cities or vertices land close to each other, I draw a line between them, I connect them, and they merge, if you like. Okay, I keep doing this one year at a time. Now, I started, remember, at 3000 BC. 5,000 years ago. Let's say we move for 3,400 years. What is the picture if you look at it from above? Now, if you were to do this in, say, continental Europe, you'd imagine little hamlets in Austria, in Germany, in France, in Switzerland. Of course, those countries did exist in their form, but no matter where the land masses are. And eventually, things start to merge. Now, you come back to about 1680, 3,400 years later, what would you see if you looked at Europe from above? Well, what you would see is essentially isolated city-states with a few of them having connections, but largely isolated independent city-states. Think of ancient Greece, Sparta, Athens, independent city-states. Okay, that's about 3,400 years after the inception of the process in the year 1680. What if you go past to 3,500 years, 3,600 years from the start? So now it's 1,400 AD. Around what happens now? Something remarkable happens. Remember, about 3,400 years after the inception, you largely had isolated city-states. Very shortly thereafter, when you cross about 3,500 years after the inception, around that time, if you do the calculation, you'll find that the average number of connections will be about one to seven. When that happens, abruptly, the whole independent landmass congeals and congregates into one massive empire. Now we understand the morality tale here from independent feudal city-states to the Holy Roman Empire in the blink of an eye. This is not predictable by native intuition, by our experience, but this is entirely predictable from the mathematics behind this. This goes back to the science, the art of probability. And this particular kind of mathematics, random graph theory, arose in the middle part of the 20th century. Uh, two of the great proponents of this were two Hungarian mathematicians, Paul Erdős and Alfred Rainey. And out of that comes a very rich theory, which epidemiologists today can utilize to understand how pandemics spread. Now, this kind of connectivity is hugely important for social science reasons. This explains, among other reasons, why there was this huge burst of intellectual activity around the world, starting about a millennia ago, 1,000 to 1,500 years ago. It's when independent feudal city-states started combining, they started getting social connectivity across larger and larger land masses. And it happened very fast in a very brief period of time. That connectivity 
led to huge advances in the human condition. And today, of course, we have got this incredibly connected modern world. So these are the benefits of connectivity. Advances, ideas, thoughts, philosophies, all spread rapidly through a global audience. But it also comes with peril, with cost. And where's the peril and the cost? Things like the rise of pandemics and the rapid spread of disease. When you had independent feudal city-states, if a disease arose somewhere, it sadly affected that subpopulation. But the population as a whole were largely unaffected. The moment everybody's connected, a small disease starting in Wuhan, in China, rapidly spreads to Italy. From Italy, it spreads to the United States. And from there, it spreads to all over the world. And now we have a pandemic. And so understanding how these things function, one needs models. Guesses, intuition, gut feeling, political uh, preferences, all of these are irrelevant to the actual progression. One looks for clarity. And the clarity arises from clear thinking, clear mathematical understandings of what the foundational structures of these spreads are. Here's one place probability theory becomes hugely important in the modern world. I'll pause if there are any questions at this point. Uh, Sanath can always jump in. But if not, I'll give you one more example. I wish I had you in front of me because when I have a class, I make eye contact, I can see people, I can see whether I'm losing you, whether the story is too abstruse, too abstract, or whether I'm boring you. But since I can't see you live, I'll rely upon interjections from Sanath to moderate and let me know if I need to stop and digress or, or clarify something. Uh, right, Professor. Um, yeah, I think uh, everyone is quite gripped right now. We just have one question, which uh, if you uh, permit, I can ask, uh, which is more from Atria. And uh, if I can paraphrase, I think the question is why we are in this pandemic and as we talk about things like R0, uh, are we able to put a number to this and say that if we are able to reduce our connections below this certain number, we are good? Uh, do we have a figure like that right now? So the story is this, right? If, the, if social isolation is kept too rigidly, then it will work. What you'll do is drive the R0 number below one, and then infection will die out. What that means is that your hospitals will not get overwhelmed. And what do you mean by it'll die out? You will have controlled it to the point where your medical systems can handle it. Will it completely vanish? Well, if you wait long enough, there's a chance that will happen because eventually the virus in each person will be triggered. People will recover, some will die sadly, but then once recovered, they are not infectious anymore. If you can drive down the infections, the the number of people who are infectious to zero, then of course the disease will stop spreading at least at this moment in time. The objective here is a little more nuanced because nobody has natural immunity for this. Nobody in the world, okay? I don't, it doesn't matter if you're in a place like India where you've been exposed to many pathogens. But no, it doesn't matter if you've had the flu before. It's irrelevant. This is a new pathogen. Our bodies do not have a natural immunity to this and other immunities don't help you here. Anybody and everybody can get sick. So governmental policy right now is to control the number of infected so that your systems don't get over that. What you're doing is buying time. Maybe you've heard about flattening the curve. If left unchecked, if the connectivity is as shown on the screen, the number of infected, the rate of infection will go like so exponentially. And then the number of people that need to be hospitalized will skyrocket. Society will come to a standstill. It's not just the people who are very sick will die, but people who need other treatments, like heart treatments, uh, congestive disorders, diabetes, all of them will be affected. And of course, then your economy is affected because you'll have gaps here, there, everywhere, in addition to massive social, social turmoil because of loss of life. This is the curious case of the opinion poll. And then a strange follow-up. 
And what the hell does that have to do with vaccines? So, and of course, underlying all of this is a rich, beautiful mathematical story, which goes back three centuries. And for somebody like me, I love history. I love the tapestry of mathematics, of science, of human, the human condition over time to see how developments unfold. And I'll tell you a little bit of the story here. Right? Let's start with the opinion poll, right? I want to show you a picture. This is from the United States. Um, I could, I spent a little time trying to find a similar picture for India, and I just don't want to spend enough time to try. This is a picture of the political landscape of the United States in 2008, immediately after a presidential election, where a Democrat, President Obama, was elected. So the country voted for the Democrats. Blue is Democratic, red is Republican. The intensity shows you something about the populations. And you can see how the country was distributed in 2008. The coasts tend to be liberal, tend to be democratic. The hinterland, the rural areas, then, and now, and in the past, tended to be more conservative, Republican, so here's a picture. On the bottom left of your screen, you're actually seeing a uh, snapshot of what the, the demographics look like in time. So right now you're looking at about 1925, immediately after the First World War and the Spanish flu, which decimated populations. 20,000 people died in Philadelphia alone. This was in 1918. It's un unimaginable. The pandemic today, this is the closest related to the 1918 Spanish flu. And actually the picture shows how the colors are changing. It's also showing you the mood of the country, right? 1968, you're talking about the Cold War, you're talking about the Iran hostage crisis, 1975, 1980. This is, you're walking into the Reagan years. You can see how the country's mood is changing. Let's imagine that you have two, two major parties, right? A Republican and Democrat. Now this kind of setting where you have population with two classes arises again and again and again. I'll show you one of them. In India, they say the BJP and the Congress, I know there are many other parties, but two major parties at a time. And along these lines, you find others. For example, in Florida, in the Everglades, it's a wonderful national park. The US has, has got magnificent national parks all over the country, preserved pristine, verdant. In Florida, it's the Florida Everglades. The, the creature at the top of the food pyramid there is the uh, Florida alligator. But about three decades ago, a new interloper appeared, a large predator, the Burmese python. And the python and the alligator have been vying for supremacy since then in the Florida Everglades. Uh, if you have a strong stomach, you can Google or see a BBC website, uh, Python eats alligator. And you'll find a huge python has just swallowed a huge alligator. The alligator wasn't going to go quietly and is best out of the stomach of the python. You have two large dead creatures on the screen. I only do it if you have a strong stomach. But what does this have to do with anything? Well, the problem is that the python is an interloper. How did a Burmese python get into Florida? Well, somebody, you know, one cannot account for people's tastes, thought that a a small python would make a cute pet. And of course, a small python becomes a very large python, and they say, yeah, I don't want this. What do you do with it? Oh, there's a neighboring Everglades forest. Let me just dump it there. Uh, the python had no natural predator, and suddenly it now becomes rampant, and now it's by with the alligator at the top of the food pyramid, and that's affecting the entire ecosystem down the line. Things like this are happening repeatedly. If you go to Tekadi, you'll find that the lakes are being choked by interlopers from outside. Uh, you'll find in the area I live in, in Pennsylvania, a wonderfully, very beautiful flowering tree called the Japanese maple. Of course, it's from Japan. It's a, it's a nuisance, it's a weed. It grows about 15 or 20 feet high. It looks beautiful. It keeps changing color through the year, but it's choking all our forests. And the slow growing massive trees, the white oaks, the beaches are all getting choked because this thing grows so quickly, it chokes off all light. Humans move, and as we move, we take species with us, and that creates changes in the environment. If you're on the African Great Lakes of Victoria, Tavanaica, Malawi, it's home to some of the most fertile and rich species of fish, the cyclids. Incredible variety, genetic variety. Some 50 years ago, sports fishermen introduced the Nile perch, a voracious attacking fish because they wanted some for sports fishing. The cyclists are just languid, they're too easy to catch. 
And of course, that's changed the balance of the entire ecosystem in the African Great Lakes. So, if you're an ecologist, you'd like to know what's the balance? What is the current invasive versus indigenous? How do you do this? Here's another example. Okay. More prosaic. Industrial quality control, you're Apple, you want to build, let's say, uh, the new iPhone in, uh, in China. A certain fraction of the devices built are defective. Of course, if you're a company, you want to control the number of defectives. What fraction of your yield are defective? Here's one more. Natural selection is ruthless. Darwinian selection is amoral. It doesn't care about morality. It just does what it does. And it weeds out traits which are not helpful. How does that explain then the prevalence of defective re recessive genes leading to, for example, sickle cell anemia or Tay-Sachs disease where your brain turns to mush, where in a small unfortunate portion of the population, people are afflicted and they die. Why hasn't that been weeded out? Well, if you're a medical professional, you'd like to know what percentage of the population has Tay-Sachs disease and what percentage of the population is immune from it. Here's one more. And I'll come back to this at the very end. What does this have to do with anything? What do you mean by vaccines? What has it got to do with the dichotomy? I'll come to it. And of course, the ubiquitous opening poll. In India, what percentage of people approve of the lockdown? Or what percentage of people approve of the Kashmir, uh, uh, the regimen put in place uh, about six months ago? Uh, what percentage of people approve of the Congress or of the BJP? What percentage of people like the newest movie? I don't know who the current uh, actors are. I just got a, in a text message from a very old friend from, from high school who said, who'd been watching an Amitabh Bachchan movie. And he says, you should watch it because he's playing LOL, a South Indian math professor named Venkat Subramanian. You should watch it. I said, oh, okay. Hey, what are your opinions? Now, in all of these cases, one has a population and a mixture. And as a social scientist, you're interested in estimating the mixture. How does one do that? And naturally, one way to do it is go count everything, but that's a very difficult time consuming process. For an election, that means a general election, where you don't do it every day. But you know, in things like an invasive indigenous species, you, know, you really don't have the option of going and counting every creature. How do you estimate population mixtures? Well, the natural answer is you sample randomly from the population. And if you do that, Right. You've got a poll, if you like, from a population at large. Uh, let's imagine that we are in India. Now, you know, most people are not a dorky enough like me, a nerd like me, to go and look at fine detail at the fine print of an article. But if one reports a poll, well, I'd like to know well, how many people were asked, what kinds of guarantees have been provided. Well, that's in the fine print in any reliable poll. And if you ask, you know, if I ask my classes here, how many? And uh, get all kinds of responses. I, it's hard to do that in real time uh, electronically, so I'm not going to try this. But people usually guess, oh, a poll might have, they might ask about a few hundred people. Somebody might boldly say, well, maybe a thousand people. Okay. Let's say you ask a thousand people about anything you like. Uh, let's say about their opinions on the lockdown in India currently. Okay. Or maybe the opinion on whether you believe scientists or mathematicians, or whether it's all fake news. What are people's opinions? And you ask a thousand people. And ideally, you do it randomly. You close your eyes, you go, you need me, money, well, across the entire population. And you pick a thousand and you ask them. And now in India, a thousand people is out of a population of a billion. Now, to put that in context, the ratio of a thousand to a billion is about one in a million. Now, all right, imagine that you were in a country like Iceland, which in the summer has got a million people in it. Now, you want to ask their opinions about something. You close your eyes and you randomly pick somebody, let's say in Reykjavik, and you ask her, uh, excuse me, ma'am, uh, what do you think about this? And she gives you her opinion, honestly. Does her opinion reflect the million people in Iceland? Absurd. This is ridiculous. If one in a million is absurd, why is it 1,000 in a billion equally absurd? An opinion poll is a ridiculous object. So, is everything fake? Should we believe anything at all? Do you understand the quandary I have? 
to get data, you effectively sample a small portion of large populations. Why should that small portion say something useful about this huge population underlying? Now, to put this in context, you understand one, this is a random game. You can't ask 1,000 specific people or one specific person because then you can skew the results any way you like. If, for example, you want to ask what fraction of the country in India support the Congress and what fraction support the BJP, if you go to ask a thousand Congress supporters, then all of them will say Congress and you'll be led to believe everybody in the country likes Congress. If you only ask BJP supporters, then you'll be led to imagine that everybody supported the BJP. I mean, that's useless. That doesn't give you any information. You have to do this randomly so that nobody can game the system. So it's a random game. Now, in a random game, you could accidentally ask a thousand Congress supporters. It can happen, but the odds are very small. And then the fraction of a thousand who support a Congress, if you do it randomly, you're postulating that that looks like what the fraction is in the whole population. You are going to make an error. Errors are inescapable in this random game. But it's not just an error. You can only make things with a certain confidence because you could be very unlucky and just get a very skewed subpopulation. Bad things do happen to good polls. Bad things do happen to good students like you, albeit rarely. So in other words, every time you do a random game like this, you are going to make errors and you can only assert your results with a certain confidence. Mathematics is a codification of human thought. It is a stylized, formal universe taken away from the human universe. Let me give you geometry as an example. Geometry, there are geometric relationships all around us. And the ancient Greeks, and actually, actually even in, in ancient Vedic times in India, in Egypt, people were thinking about these relationships. And if you look at certain fire rituals uh, to the fire god Agni, you'll find various geometric concepts involving right angle triangles, the Pythagorean, Pythagorean ideas come into play. The ancient Greeks were the first to formalize this. And what a scribe in Alexandria did 2,000 years ago changed the world. The scribe was a young man named Euclid. And what did he do? He said, look, these ideas are lines. Let's abstract these key principles and make a mathematical universe out of this. Today, we call that Euclidean geometry. He started with five assumptions about the bedrock of that universe, the foundations of that universe. He said, Okay, there are these objects which we all have a common understanding of. A point is a dimensionless object. A line has got length but no breadth. I don't know what that means. Okay, no physical line has got length and no breadth because a physical line is made of, of atoms or, or subatomic particles, all of which have got dimension. But the abstraction is something which has got no width. You see, there's nothing like that in the natural universe. You've abstracted the natural universe. Now, we start with this, and then he created five assumptions about the relationships of these objects. Between any two points is a line. And, you know, going on through five hypotheses, the fifth axiom is the one which is controversial, is the parallel lines axiom, which says that parallel lines never meet. Of course, he's thinking about an infinite flat universe. If you allow parallel lines to meet, you get other geometries, things like Riemannian geometries, which are central to, for example, the general theory of relativity. But no matter, the Euclidean geometry is a flat geometry. And what general relativity showed us, what Einstein discovered in the early 20th century, was that the universe is not flat. It's bent. It's curved. Every mass curves space around it. There is no flat segment anywhere in space. There is no straight line in the Euclidean sense anywhere in our space. Well, why does Euclidean geometry work when you apply it? Because on the scale of the earth, on the scale of your cities, of your classroom, your, your room, the curvature is so small, it is approximately flat. And therefore, Euclidean predictions based upon, let's say, a right angle triangle and a Pythagoras' theorem are to an extraordinary degree accurate, but they're not exact. If you try to use the Pythagorean theorem on the scale of the galaxy, then you will go wildly wrong. You think you're going to Alpha Centauri and you find you're going to Betelgeuse because the universe is curved. 
This is what mathematics does. It abstracts out from physical reality and creates a stylized mathematical universe, which functions under its own laws and has its own consequences, which you call theorems. To the extent that universe mirrors some aspects of our life, we can take those predictions and apply them to its life. It is the same way that in the theory of chance and probability theory, it's one of the oldest mathematical subjects. But it's only unlike Euclidean geometry, it's very recently that it was codified as a mathematical subject. Andrei Kolmogorov in Moscow in 1933 laid down a mathematical axiomatization of probability theory separate from our experience, but folding into it a deep part of that experience, what he felt was germane and relevant. Is it applicable? Well, our experience over the 20th and 21st centuries tells us it was, it's been enormously applicable. It's been rich, it's been fruitful. But that mathematical universe is a stylized universe which allows us to examine relationships between objects divorced of the obfuscations, the complexities, the noise, the dust, that other unrelated issues create and confuse the matter. It allows us to look at these pristine objects. Understanding that gives you a true understanding of the foundations and the applications. So for true understanding, you want to make sure that you absorb like a sponge broadly. Of course, you want to get good at at least one or two things so that you can make initial progress in a certain direction, but don't misunderstand or give short shrift to the importance of getting a broad liberal foundation, because I can guarantee you one thing. In today's world, it's very unlikely you will stay in one job for the rest of your life. You're going to move. You're going to be doing all kinds of things. And if you learn only one thing, if you become the world's expert in Microsoft Excel, great, you might get a job tomorrow and they pay you a lot of money. But in three years, Excel will are gone. And now you don't have a job. But if you've learned broadly, you've learned history, you've learned geography, you've learned social science, you've learned civic responsibility, and you've learned mathematics. You understood the interplay of sciences. This is where the most profitable and, and fulfilling advances in the human condition come from. If you understand that, then yes, by all means get better at one or two things at least, but make sure you have this rich foundation and make sure you keep learning. It's really difficult under these conditions, but if you do that, then you will position yourself for a career which is fulfilling, which is successful by various measures, and which actually makes a difference. Thank you.